All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley. I work at Firestorm Books and Coffee, and I'm here to introduce what should be a really lively and interesting conversation tonight. The panel features four speculative fiction and science fiction authors discussing their experiences writing during a global pandemic and its ability to help imagine new pathways and possibilities forward. For folks who aren't familiar, Firestorm is a collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, with a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist thought and culture. We host a wide range of events, workshops, film screenings, and presentations, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. However, since the start of the pandemic, our doors have remained closed to the public, and we have shifted our operation to a mostly online virtual space. So we are still very much selling books uh, online, and all of the titles featured tonight can be purchased directly from our website and shipped anywhere in the United States. We've also had a lot of success in converting our community programming to online virtual events. And if you're wanting more opportunities to attend these kinds of panel discussions, as well as other author events and book clubs, or you appreciate the work that we do and want to ensure our continued existence, you can sign up for our community sustainers program on Patreon where a small monthly contribution helps support us to continue putting resources toward creating content like this, as well as offering you a 10% discount on all orders from our store. Tonight's event was organized in collaboration with our friends at PM Press. PM Press is an independent radical publisher with an aim to deliver bold political ideas and vital stories to all walks of life. Tonight's panel will feature four outspoken authors, a series from PM Press showcasing fiction writers' most provocative and politically challenging stories in the form of interviews, short stories, essays, and biographies. And they are really great pocket-sized little books that y'all should definitely check out and pick up. Um, tonight's event is the third in an ongoing series of events in collaboration with PM Press, the next of which you can catch on Thursday, February 25th, which will be a conversation with the Working Class History Collective. So thanks again to PM Press for helping to organize tonight's discussion. So as I said earlier, tonight's conversation features a panel of speculative fiction and science fiction writers who will discuss lessons, challenges, and strategies for writing during a, global, during a global pandemic, as well as what exploring these kinds of ideas and approaches to fiction have to offer our political and social movements. Panelists include Meg Elison, Nalo Hopkins, Nisi Shaw, and will be moderated by Terry Bisson. Um, one, one note before I introduce the panelists, I just want to take a second to talk about the tech for folks who are in attendance. Uh, we are using Zoom webinar to broadcast this event tonight. And after I offer the introductions and hand the conversation over Terry, to Terry to moderate, our panel will talk for about 30 minutes. Um, but throughout their conversation, attendees will have the opportunity to submit questions through the Q&A function, um, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so feel free while the discussion is happening, if there's any, any uh, ideas or questions that come up for you to submit those questions. And then Terry, our moderator, uh, we'll be paying attention to the Q&A function and we'll work some of those questions into the discussion as we flow along. So great. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce tonight's panelists. Meg Elison is a California, Bay, a California Bay Area author and essayist. She writes science fiction and horror as well as feminist essays and cultural criticism. Her debut novel, The Book of the Unnamed Midwife, won the 2014 Philip K. Dick Award. Her YA debut, Find Layla, was published in fall of 2020 by Skyscape and was on Vanity Fair's Best Books of 2020. 
Nalo Hopkinson, born in Jamaica and now living in California, is a superstar of modern fantasy. Her award-winning novels include Brown Girl in the Ring, The Salt Roads, and The New Moon's Arms, among many others. Her short story collection, Skin Folk, was the winner of the World Fantasy Award and the Sunburst Award. She has edited and co-edited a number of fantasy anthologies and taught at the Clarion workshops, as well as other venues. She is a founding member and currently on the advisory committee of the Carl Brandon Society, which exists to further the conversation on race and ethnicity in science fiction and fantasy. Nisi Shaw is an African-American writer, editor, and journalist. They're best known for their science fiction and fantasy stories written in the feminist tradition of Ursula Le Guin, Octavia Butler, and Joanna Russ, with novels challenging race, gender, and sexual orientation. They live in Seattle, where they also write on political and cultural matters for the Seattle Times. And finally, graciously moderating tonight's conversation is Terry Bisson, who was for many years a Kentuckian living in New York City and is now a New Yorker living in California. In addition to science fiction, he has written bios of Mumia Abu-Jamal and Nat Turner. He's also the host of a popular San Francisco reading series, SF in SF, which folks should definitely check out and is the editor of PM's Outspoken Authors Pocketbook series. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Terry. Well, okay. Um, well, I guess I would, I would start by saying I'm, I'm mostly here as the editor of the series, which I'm, I'm doing with um, PM. And um, only, I'm also a, a an author in the series, but that's only because that was the editor and I stuck myself in at the very beginning. And um, and this this whole thing, I'd, I'd like to begin just by saying one of the special things happening right now is that one of our authors is a grand master and soon to be a grand master of science fiction, taking what's probably the biggest thing the only thing bigger than the Hugo in the tiny world of science fiction, where your, your, your influence on the field and its development is celebrated by, and it usually happens when you're very, very old. And, um, and some of the people uh, like uh, the, first, the first person ever pulled into this was Robert Hanlon and this is golden age science fiction. This is stuff of the 50s. So it's still going today. And the youngest uh, of, the, um, of the grand masters of science fiction, which I think it now has a different name, but, but anyway, is a, one of our authors, which is Nalo Hopkinson, who's also the youngest person ever indu inducted into this, which uh, you had, I, it's it's kind of scary, I think, but um, that's up to you. <laughs> you know, the, it usually means remember her career. It's over now, but she was a great deal. But I think she's still quite active in the field, and uh, and she joins in our series. We have three or four others, I think. Also, Ursula Gwynn and um, who else? Michael Moorcock, I believe, is a grandmaster. And who else? Uh, there was somebody else. Um, well, certainly Ursula, and but anyway, it's a it's a big deal, and I just want to say personally uh, to you as a as a colleague, uh, I I think it 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 really is a big deal, and I want to congratulate you. So. Thank you, thank you, Terry. Um, it 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 is a big deal, and uh, when people say at sixty she's the youngest, I think sixty. 60, when did that happen? I have 60 whole years I get to keep all for myself. <laughs> but thank you. So, um, I don't know, I, we could start our discussion. We've got um, Meg and Nisi, as well as me and Nalo here. And I would, I would just begin by offering um, or the, the question of writing in a pandemic always seemed a little redundant to me because for a, a writer always writes in a pandemic. It means you can't go anywhere. 
You can't see anybody. You can't do anything. You can't really talk to anybody because you're sitting there with your computer or a piece of paper. So I don't know why writing, writing seems to be the only thing that's not changed by the pandemic. If you're a musician or an actor or uh, any number of other things, uh, the pandemic has has crippled your career. It's it's changed everything. For us, I, it hadn't changed much for me, Not partly because I'm an old man and I'm pretty much retired, but I'd still write and edit. And uh, that's not, that's no different in the pandemic. I don't know, has it has, I would ask you guys, do you have any difference from where you have to stay at home and, and don't get to dress up and don't get to go out? <laughs> well, so for us, um, I think that most of us write by ourselves, but there are a lot of people who used to go out to cafes and write. They used to, is, I don't know, is that is that a part of your process, Meg? Yeah, I, I belong to a group of people here in Oakland that meets every day, every week on Fridays. And we used to meet in this wonderful little Brazilian cafe up on Park in Oakland and get together and talk about our careers and our lives and what was going on, bullshit for about 15 minutes. And then everybody sit together and write. And it provided this wonderful like cross-pollinating atmosphere to talk to different authors about where they were at, what are they working on today. So being deprived of that has definitely changed my process. And although we still do it online, it's not at all the same. There's a, a lack of ambient noise and a lack of emotional connection. And there's that thing that people seek out in other people. I'll also say, not for me, but for many of the authors that I'm friends with, the difference in being home is not a change to their writing process, but it is a change to whether or not their children go to school. I think any writers who have small children in their houses right now have got to be losing their fucking minds. Like the house is never empty. It's never quiet. There's no regular hours. There's no expected period of time when your children will come and go. You're just always stuck with them, which yeah. it sounds ruinous to a career for me. So one thing that has been going on for me is I was a solitary, as I would say, I would, you know, I, I would like, you know, go to my altar, do the prayer, then nobody talked to me for six hours, like no words, nothing. Um, and that is, I now do um, two, two hour meetings daily in which I'm meeting with other writers. And we do that thing you're talking about, Meg, with like 15 minutes of like, you know, talking about like, well, this character is not behaving, you know, why are they trying to play softball? They're a nerd, stop it. Um, <laughs> or, you know, we'll talk about scones or whatever. And then we shut up and, and write for 45 minutes. So I do that like with two different groups. And one of the groups includes someone who has children with her, not small children, but uh, grade school and middle school and she can't always participate because sometimes she has to help them with their um, algebra or whatever. It's actually meant more writing for me because um, because of the ability to meet through Zoom um, in fairly isolated in Riverside uh, and so for the past few months uh, a group of us, mostly women in academe, uh, meet Monday to Friday for two hours. And that's how I got the novel finished that I finished recently because it, it had been going begging for over a decade. Um, so in some ways it's meant more contact, but I keep thinking of Marshall McLuhan, you know? <laughs> uh, it, it's high tech, but it's not high touch. Um, and I, I really hear you both about, about people who have to be cloistered with other people. Uh, I'm, on the cre I'm in the creative writing department. And when we have meetings, um, some of my colleagues are, are going dark because you can hear them like chopping up apples for their kids, right? <laughs> they're, doing, they're doing three and four things all at once and trying to maintain a writing practice and a teaching practice. I think what's also changed is the emotional weight of what we're doing and the time in which we're doing it. I know I spent the first few months of lockdown just feeling fury because 
I kept having this 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 feeling of all right. So we're all spec fic writers, we're all science fiction writers, whatever you want to call it, fantasy writers. We've been talking about this stuff for fucking ever. Us and the researchers who are doing the 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 science of it. Why haven't our governments been listening? <laughs> you know, it didn't have to be like this. I didn't actually want to be living in an Octavia Butler novel. Um, <laughs> Bless like, heart, I'd much are. rather read them. Yeah. Terrible of the sower on parade every day. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, was I remember, I remember uh, um, Stan Robinson and uh, Karen Fowler when she, she lived in Davis where Stan lives. And they used to meet uh, every day uh, at a coffee shop and they would they would probably gossip and talk for five or ten minutes but basically they would sit in the shop and they would write in longhand <laughs> for about an hour or two and then they would go home and and type it in you know and um, I always thought that was kind of strange because I, I love to hang out with writers I know a lot of writers but we never write together so I never exactly sit down in the same room with others. So it's strange to me, but it it um, it apparently works for other yeah. people. Yeah. It's really working. I, Timmy Duchamp, who was not writing at all, um, I, I meet with her every day now, and it, there's something about the accountability. And I'll tell you one thing that, um, do, do not broadcast this beyond us 100 people. <laughs> <laughs> Tell someone, oh, I can't do that. I have to write. They don't care. But if you tell them, I can't do that. I have a meeting. They go away. They yep. leave you alone. <laughs> <laughs> yep. My meeting might be a Zoom date. I call it a meeting. <laughs> uh, have what I found is that also the the demands that I write have increased. Because yeah. the minute everything went pear shaped, the artists went into high into high drive because that's what we do. We keep communities together. So it was, would you contribute to this anthology? Um, this thing that we're going to where you were supposed to be teaching is now no longer in person. So instead, you're going to be doing twelve workshops. It's um, all stuff that is right and good and necessary to do, but it's sort of like gone through the roof. Uh, and I'm just sort of sitting here staring at it because the reason I need people to write with me is because I have no focus. I can last 10 minutes and I got to go, you know, make tea or something. Um, and, and having all these demands is wonderful and needful, but also uh, a pressure on can I keep performing? Can I keep doing this thing I do? Well, now you have to keep because you're a grand master, so... <laughs> that's when you get to retire, right? <laughs> I think that means she can slack off. Like she's done as much work as she's required to do to be great. Yeah, well, maybe that's the case. I don't know. Well, that brings to another question that they they gave us these topics that we're supposed to deal with. Uh, Ash did. I guess he made them up. But um, one of them, I think, uh, DC mentioned it, uh, um, and how to activism. And assuming that we're all some lefties or used to be lefties or somewhere on the um, somewhere to the to the left of Joe Biden, you know, uh, <laughs> who's not to the left of Joe Biden? Yeah, anyway. yeah I'm, I'm Canadian. <laughs> I'm off the horizon <laughs> in the left. All right, but we're all uh, most of us, most of you in particular, and me not so much, but we're all public figures, and that's a form of activism. I know that Nisi, Nisi uh, reviews books a lot. I think Nalo is a teacher. I think Meg has a, um, yeah, do you still have your literary salon? Is that still beating? I love literary salon, and it's something that I put a lot of my time and attention into, but unfortunately, since it's not safe to gather anywhere, we have not had one in a year. We talked about moving it to digital, but I've watched other poetry and reading series really suffer by doing that and, and in the end not be able to pay creators. So we are waiting this out, but it still exists. We will be back. Okay. Well, everybody's... Um... But is that activism? Does that is that the same thing? Is that what you meant, Nisi, about act of uh, activism somehow fueling or energizing writing? 
Uh, no, actually, that's not what I meant. <laughs> uh, no. let, let, so let me try and explain. Um, so what I was thinking of is how the um, pandemic has made activism more possible. Um, I truly believe that lockdown is responsible for the resurgence of say, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, because people look around, they say, you mean all that can change? Well, then this can change too. And uh, so uh, I think that that attitude is what I was talking about fueling uh, creativity. Um, because if, uh, if the world can be reshaped, then um, let's, let's write about how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to say. Hope it makes sense. It does, it does. Yeah. I yeah. do think that I, I took part in some BLM marches and protests in Oakland over the summer and the fall. And I do think that creating uh, an entire class of people who are unemployed or underemployed for an unknowable number of months certainly contributed to the number of people on the streets this summer. And moreover contributed to the number of white arrestable people who were willing to get out front because we don't have to be at work on Monday morning. <laughs> That made such a big difference because, I mean, uh, Black people have been calling this stuff out since we have been, but to see so many non-Black people on the ramparts, I, I did not think I would ever see um, in, in my lifetime, and that's, that's meant a lot. I've been protesting since I was old enough to sneak out at night and do it, <laughs> <laughs> and I will definitely say that the tenor on the streets has been different this year than anything I've ever seen. And there are people I've met at protests who are so unprepared and in the exactly wrong shoes <laughs> and like have purses on and clearly did not think this through. That you just know it's their first time that this is that these issues are getting to people who would never have otherwise seen themselves in the streets. And they have you know, they've got masks on for the pandemic, but not masks on for tear gas, and they are learning a whole new world. And that's been very encouraging for me to see. And what yeah. I love is that I don't recall hearing about any spike in COVID after the protests. <laughs> well, I don't think there was, and I think people expected it. And, um, and I too was, um, I wasn't um, out on the streets uh, because I'm well over 70 years old. But I was uh, also amazed at the, the number of young white people that all of a sudden discovered that there was a, a racist terror that was going on in America that they hadn't noticed. And all of a sudden, you know, and it became, it, it, was, it was remarkable. I mean, it was, it was like one of those things that kind of occurred, sort of like Occupy did and sort of like, uh, yeah. They kind of come and then and then they diminish and then they go away, but they they still leave a marker and they and I I think that we're still um, well we're living in the reaction to it right now. That's a lot of what I think the the stuff that happened at the Capitol was uh, the the um, the backlash against uh, all the all the stuff that Black Lives Matter raised. But I think it. I think it was significant, and I agree with Meg. It was. It was. Edwin Nala, it was surprising and kind of heartening. You know, it was. It was quite heartening. Uh, and uh, one of the things we did in our department is, um, I talked to my students because I'm at a university that is something like seventy-seven percent people of color, um, much higher numbers, uh, Latinx numbers, but still people of color. And um, I took one whole class just so that they could debrief about COVID, about the protests, about what was going on in their lives. And the numbers of them who felt like they weren't doing enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was both lovely and I, I get to feel like a mom. I'm not anybody's mom, but I have students. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I hear students saying things like, well, it's been 10 whole weeks, I should have figured out how to work online by now. I'm like, okay, pandemic, let's go over what that word means and cut yourself some slack. So one of the things that I've been 
doing is saying a lot of people don't feel like writing, don't feel like they can make mm -hmm. art. Um, they feel numbed out, they feel tired, they feel scared. And I think we have to keep letting people know that that's normal and valid and okay. Um, yeah. And that self-care is as important, if not more so than it ever was. Yep, yep, I'm right there with you. I have a, a number of friends who are very motivated by the idea that the people whose work they dislike the most is doing just fine during this time. Like if you imagine the, the most successful mediocre asshole you can imagine and you think to yourself, well, he's sitting at home writing another Brandon Sanderson ripoff novel. Like if you don't get on it, he certainly will. If you don't come out of this thing with a book ready to show your agent, he's gonna. I know spite is an imperfect motivator and I know eventually we all burn out. But when my friends have come to me and said, I'm not writing and I don't know what to do, spite's the first thing I try. Yeah, yeah, it, there's an energy there for sure. And the thing is I'm hearing from agents who are saying they're doing more deals now than they ever have. Yeah. Wow. So either publishers are expecting more readers or readers are, are causing that demand. Um, so it's a, in a weird way, it's not a, hmm, it's a bad time, but in a weird way, there are, there are things that are happening as a result that would not have. Right. I know, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, just, I'm just chiming in saying yes, yes, yes. I know not everybody's books are on the dreaded A word, but I will say that I've not seen numbers like this in the Kindle store in my own personal work for a long time. And I know a lot of other authors whose books are available there are saying the same thing. Like people are tired of Netflix and spending a lot more time listening to books while washing the dishes. And there is definitely a desire and a need. And if this is not a good reason to be pushed toward reading more books, but I'm always happy to see people read more books. Well, see, it, it hits me a different way because I'm, I'm really old school about publishing. I worked in New York publishing for 10 years and, um, and I still associate publishing with an actual physical book. And I, uh, uh, and I think of being a writer as being published by somebody other than yourself. And, uh, you know, they have always played to that, um, to that gallery and so it it only i, I self-published a book about um a year ago for the first time and i had never wanted to do it i had always felt that it was um so i'm i'm very old school with all this stuff and i'm surprised um nala was saying that agents are doing well and um i'm surprised at that i find um the i, I occasionally help out other writers and edit books to four other writers and I always tell them I can't find you an agent I think finding an agent now that actually um, can operate I find it very difficult um, and and um, I don't I don't know what that means but to me it's it's a different world and it's one that I'm not I, that I don't like all that much where mm. everybody wants to be a writer everybody wants to get, be published I want to see it I want to see it a narrow bottle, a bottleneck that you have to figure out a way through to make it happen. And that's that's all just an old man's ego problem. <laughs> I think so. Because, I mean, that's what agents are. They're that bottleneck. So, <laughs> yes, so. And I find the ones that, that are talking about um, doing more deals are the ones who have stayed current with the times and the... The, the political sensibility, changing political sensibilities and changing aesthetics. Um, and so as the publishers are looking for that work, they have authors who are doing it. Um, it's just something about what you said made me think of <sighs> sensibilities changing. One of the things I do is I'm, I'm an amateur, very amateur fabric designer. I have um, designs up on Spoonflower where people can buy my stuff as fabric or um, wallpaper. And I make, you know, maybe 500 bucks a year, except last year, because all of a sudden I have one pattern that's the biohazard um, symbol made into fabric. That thing started running out the door <laughs> because people were making masks and people with a sense of humor were making masks. 
<laughs> we're all biohazards, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought about that because uh, with you, Nalo, about, I, I've talked about that because my wife is also a fabric artist. She works in, in quilts and there's a whole society of, of there's a society, a history, a, an aesthetic about quilting that has its, its own universe that, um, that seems to be booming right now. And um, I don't know if people make money at it, but um, it seems to work. They sure make art with it. <laughs> and sometimes very, very political art. It's lovely. Well, I also want to raise the issue of masks because we, um, it seems to me like a writer is always working behind a mask that you never really write in your own person. And that most writers, they, they adopt different masks and maybe they writing is a process of putting them on or taking them off. Maybe when you're writing with other people, you, 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 uh, I don't know how that works, but it always seems when I'm writing, I'm always assuming another uh, personality. That's the way I particularly do it. And some people are, are doing, you know, more from their own heart, but I, I work more from my masks and I was going to just ask uh, how you all related to that way of seeing work as a fiction writer in particular. I, I don't know that I write, I, I, I probably am one of those people that uh, write from my heart, but my heart is um, a multifaceted gem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it is. <laughs> it's not, um, I, I waited to write novels till late in life because I kept telling people I can't be the same person all the, you know, long enough to write this, so. And Terry, I've, I read your work. I'm going to say your masks are your heart. <laughs> well, well the, yeah, one hopes for that. Thank you. <laughs> your, your heart is clear on the page. <laughs> one, one of the things that I took, identified with uh, that you said, Nalo, is um, about the increase in uh, appearances, teaching, uh, all of that sort of stuff. I, I too have seen an uptick in that. And um, I was recently teaching a class in which uh, one of the exercises we gave to the students was write about a particular celebrity from the viewpoint of another celebrity. And, you know, there's all this stuff, uh, all this writing the other stuff, you know, you know, you want to make sure that they have a different demographic category or whatever. So uh, after the exercise, uh, deliberately not asking them to read what they wrote, um, one of the questions we asked was, um, what was hard about this? And a woman said, well, what was hard was assuming the, the uh, personality of someone else. What was hard was writing from someone else's viewpoint. <laughs> right? <laughs> At which I was like, okay, so tell me how hard it is to find the keyboard because that is what we do. The hell? <laughs> and yet all communicating that. that yes we are i think we are much the same way and I, I think that anybody who struggles to find the voice of the other or who struggles to put their mask on to leave their fucking house it's a failure of empathy like i, I don't think of what i'm doing as masking or as a series of impersonations or as zipping up a wetsuit i think of developing radical empathy for someone who is in some cases very different from me and try to look from their point of view as sympathetically as possible. How has everything that they've seen, heard and done brought them to who they are and what they do now? And how can I show that to an audience so that they believe it too? And I mean, everybody says that reading novels develops empathy in a person, but I think writing it develops it very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we still have this attitude that we're wearing the masks to protect ourselves. Um, we're wearing them to protect others. It's it's, it. it's 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 mutual. That's it. People who aren't wearing them are saying, fuck you, I don't care about you. Right? <laughs> A failure of empathy. Well, uh, do you see what's happening with your sequel to Everfair? Are you working on it still? Why are you asking me that? <laughs> Of course, we're talking about literature, and I'm talking to three authors who uh, who make a living or 
pretend to make a living that way. So. Okay. All right. So um, I actually have been working on uh, Kinning, the sequel to Everfair, the novel sequel to Everfair, uh, since March of last year. I started during the pandemic. I huh. started during lockdown. Um, and I can, with, with these meetings that I hold with other writers, I can produce 200 to 600 words a day, which is, you know, pitiful compared to some people's boast of like 6,000 words today and whatever, but it is accreting. Um, the last month I have, I have not been working on it because I've been doing other things, um, writing a story about uh, reparations uh, in which Black people get reparations, but, you know, there's a but. There, the, uh, the 40 acres is underwater. <laughs> you told me that idea and I thought, damn, that's good. Damn. <laughs> it's what, it's what would happen. happen, it's what's gonna happen. Yeah. So yeah, that and uh, revising a middle grade novel, but done with those, so onward. Um, and I have until July 31st, 300 words a day. Gonna make it, I think. Okay. <laughs> Well, in my day, uh, publishers' deadlines for books were very elastic. So they didn't, it wasn't like the magazine business. If you were in, in the book business, it was very elastic. Nobody expected you to be on time. Uh, has that changed? I mean, do you think people really would well, cancel it or would complain if, if it was six months late? I have snapped that elastic several times. <laughs> I have already, um, yeah, stretched it as far as it will go, I think. Okay, I'm just curious. I think uh, I've heard a lot of stories from writers who are significantly older than me about things in the business that I cannot now imagine. Uh, highly elastic deadlines being one of them, uh, being assigned to write something with an expense account being another. <laughs> What? I, what? <laughs> the rest of us are going, say more. <laughs> I, I read all about uh, Hunter S. Thompson because I, I admire his work so much. And I was a journalist for a while in my career. And he talks about having an expense account from uh, Rolling Stone or from Penthouse or whoever was paying him to follow Nixon around or fucking do drugs in Vegas. So that he has just this endless reserve of money to pull on, which is unimaginable. So what I wanted to say was, I've only been a pro since uh, 2014 or so. And in that time, I have learned that there are a hundred writers who would die to take my place, that I have to hit all my deadlines and that I have to do what I say I will do. I trust you when you say these things are elastic, but I've never trusted the net enough to fall on it. Mm. I've Don't had to because of being sick. Uh, for so many years when deadlines would just sail right past me and some of them were elastic but they would only stretch so far and it's it's why I ended up my publisher eventually dropped me because um, I was so unable to finish a story and they hung in as long as they could um, so it it's it's not gone 180 I don't think but I think you sort of have to learn which ones you can have a little bit of give with and always, always, always tell the publisher or editor as soon as you know there's a problem. Yeah. Well, it used to be also that there were small publishers and, and now they've all gotten eat. Now there's only two or three, you know. Oh, no. So, no. so there's <laughs> a lot of, uh, but I remember, uh, you know, 50 years ago, uh, you'd go to a science fiction convention and you'd go to the bar and sit with, Ellen Dadlow and Alice uh, and Alice Turner and and uh, David Hartwell and Gardner Dozois, and they would buy all the drinks because they had expense accounts. You know? True. That's, true. That's I love the story. Gone. Yeah. Well, that's long gone. You can't long ago. Them. Now you buy your editor a drink because you buy your editor a drink and you yeah. ask around to see who had the biggest book deal most recently, and they buy the next round. <laughs> If I saw your ass in Publishers Weekly and it said in a nice deal or a significant deal, I'm not touching the check. 
yes, the calculus of being a writer. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about the the field? I got into science fiction because it was so welcoming. I mean, I sort of fell into it by accident, but I discovered that the writers and the, and the editors and stuff were as sharp as any others uh, in the publishing world and that they were welcoming and it was a smaller world. I, well, they, I think it was, um, anyway, somebody once said that um, science fiction was the special Olympics of literature, which, um, which yes. it always, it always seemed. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, it has changed a whole lot. It, it, uh, it, it, it's leaked into everything else that's going on. And so it's not small anymore. It used to, it was what, three or 400 people, you know, back in, in 1980. And, um, uh, but it's not anymore. So how do you all experience it now? Because I'm, I'm really not in it. I'm, I'm sort of, I, I don't see it as it actually works, but you all are. Do you still feel you're in a, a subcategory of literature? Or do you, are you still seeking to break into the big mainstream or, or do you think of it that way anymore? I don't, I don't think of um, the idea of breaking into the mainstream. Sure, it would be nice if the mainstream came over here. Mm -hmm. Damn right. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna get normal anytime soon. So <laughs> the, the net has to expand to include us. <laughs> or, yeah. and, and as to welcoming yes and no, um, I, my first novel editor was Betsy Mitchell uh, and she was amazing. Um, and you know, being a New Yorker who lived in Brooklyn, married to a black man, mi mixed race kid, she was right there. Um, but you see the cracks. You see the cracks in the the, the, the field as a as a rule, as a general. Um, uh, you see how far that welcome goes, and it tends to go as far as wait, you're not going to act like a straight white guy. And then the 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 you know the the crows descend. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so I've always gone and looked for the allies because they are all, have always been there because science fiction does have um, habits of challenging, science fiction fantasy do have habits of challenging accepted wisdoms. So the people who actually listen to that and aren't just reading for the, the, the cool eyeball kicks have some thinking that they do. You can find those people. Um, it, it's not ever been for me universal in science fiction, but it is one of the places I can go where whatever I can put down on paper is not going to be seen as too outlandish for words. I um, had an experience where I got, I was on a panel with uh, Stan Robinson and um, two academics whose names I don't actually remember, um, Bruce Taylor and God knows. Um, but they, we were all snowed into this house in North Carolina after we'd done this speechifying at Duke. And um, John Kessel showed up too. So there we were and like John Kessel's like playing the piano and we're all having a grand time singing, you know, and like um, the, one of the academics turns to me and says, is everybody in science fiction this nice? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if they're not, we find out really quickly. <laughs> yeah, they can't sit with us when we find out that they're not cool people. We That's right. That's right. As, well, far as, as far as I'm concerned, science fiction and speculative fiction authors are on the cutting edge of literature. <laughs> but it takes a huge, huge push for mainstream literature to realize that. And so you get your breakthrough authors. You get the ones who are writing spec fic, but everybody pretends it's not. You get Margaret Atwood, you get Murakami, you get Michael Chabon, you get these big prize winning booker listing authors. And people are like, oh, Lincoln and the Bardo is so great. Lincoln and the Bardo is spec fic. So yeah. we are the bleeding edge of that. And every once in a while, the mainstream looks our way. 
I don't think we lose anything to them. We certainly don't lose out in sales. The only, buddy who, the only people who beat us on that are romance authors and they deserve to because they make people happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's true. And, and I always had uh, certainly uh, Ursula Gwynn uh, who they yearned to edit, to, to welcome into the mainstream uh, of everything. And she always insisted, I am a science fiction and fantasy writer. He's the anti-Hotwood. Yeah. Yeah. I'm even a little leery of the term speculative fiction. I mean, I don't mind if people use it, but yeah. for, for me, it, it I sometimes wonder if it isn't used to make what I do try and seem respectable. And I don't know yeah. what truck art has with being respectable. It's so. exactly <laughs> what it's about, yeah. <laughs> so I would deliberately say I write fantasy, I write science fiction and, and watch the, you know, <laughs> People but, draw back like it's catching. But yeah, you can you tell know, them you're a grandmaster. Well, back in the day, Vonnegut was always very, and he wrote a lot of science fiction. But absolutely, he, he wrote about he, fucking aliens. He, he, but he, he, he would never allow anyone to call him a science fiction writer, uh -huh. and and would always. Uh, and it was a commercial. There was a a reason for that you know, from his point of view. At the same time, somebody like Le Guin or Octavia Butler. I remember she said to one time that she always thought of uh, science fiction as a, as a, um, as really the mainstream and the mainstream was a, a tributary. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and she was very good about that. And I heard her one time say, I, we were at some kind of conference in South, uh, North Carolina, I think. And, you know, people would say, oh, you're a, a black writer, a woman writer, you're a, a, a this and that. And she says, I'm all that, but mainly I'm a science fiction writer. That, and she she certainly always was that her first do you, know, do you mind read her first, uh, I forget, she wrote two series that were really hardcore science fiction. The one about the, um, now I've forgotten the names of them. But I always preferred that. I, I wasn't a huge fan of the Kindred or. Um, oh, you're talking about the Owen Collies? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Kindred's an earlier novel, yeah. 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 But anyway, I mean, she, you know, she, she went through a whole, a lot of changes with the uh, with winning all the what did she win the genius award or whatever mm -hmm. and, and all that kind of stuff people are always but, trying to make you choose like so <laughs> and i love the ones who say but you're, you're just a writer aren't you you're not a, you know a queer writer or a caribbean writer and octavia's right we are all those things it's like hanky coats i pull out depending on whose attention <laughs> i want to get <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but like the authors who I look at who I want to be most like are the ones who go exactly where they want to go I look at Roxane Gay writing spec fic and mainstream fic and essays I look at Neil Gaiman with a finger in every genre pie in the universe I look at Carmen Maria Machado whose work uh, defies marketing convention and in many cases description because what she does is a thing of its own kind those are the authors I hope to be like, and those are the authors that I think help remind us that in the end, these are marketing categories and what we do is make art. Yeah, but we're counting on people to sell it. So, uh, you know, they, <laughs> they have to, they have, they have a logic to what they do. Uh, but you're right that we, we don't have to, um, we don't have to follow their logic. They're, they have to follow what, you know, we just, we just play it as it lays and hope that will fit into something. <laughs> That's how I always saw it. Yeah, I remember being mid book in the traces, you know, that, that many months of suffering when the dang thing just won't move forward. And that's when I will get brilliant ideas like this needs to be a trilogy um, <laughs> or just worry about random things and emailing my agents because it had occurred to me that no two of my books are alike. Uh, and I was getting all het up over whether this was a problem or not because I needed something else to worry about than whether I was going to finish the novel. And he said, um, that's you. That's how you write. You write the books. I'll try and find people to buy them. Have you slept yeah. yet? 
like today, have you slept at all in the past few days? And yeah, no, I haven't. Fine, I'll just go write this other strange book. But it is it is definitely a problem when you when you don't write books that kind of fit together when you haven't staked out a piece of territory and um I think of that as the Pat Murphy problem because Pat Murphy seems to reinvent herself before everything she publishes. And when yeah. people say, well, what else has she written? You name five disparate things. And it's it's a baller move and I really admire her, but it's difficult to build a career on that. It is it is hard to do. Yeah, it's hard on your agent. It's hard on your publisher. And, um, but it's more, you know, it's the way you work. And um, I had that kind of problem myself, but you know, what do you do? But as a reader, I was never, if I was looking for any similarity amongst the the books I love by particular writers, it they're the continuity yeah. themselves. So that's what I think of too. I wait, I, I watch the names that I know can bring it to me and keep bringing it to me until I tell them to stop. And I don't care what they're taking on. I believe in their ability and I want to read them again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and that surprise. Yeah, yeah, that delight of oh, it never occurred to me to read something like this, and man, I'm enjoying it. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's a problem. That means you have to somehow your name has to be associated with your character and what you're doing, you know, and that that takes um, maybe a, a big success or two, or maybe a certain case. Sometimes it happens, and sometimes it doesn't. And so, so it's difficult. It can be difficult. Mm-hmm. It's true. Well, I had one other. We bet. Let me see if there's people who have serious questions instead of us. Just... <laughs> ask us about our cars. <laughs> okay. I think there's a couple of serious questions. There are. One from Jerry and one from Johnny. From uh, how about this Johnny who wonders the librarians play? What? Hmm. Are you all seeing the same ones? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think that was. Uh, yeah, we never talk about librarians, but yeah. you know that's a, that's a guaranteed sale. <laughs> that's why they publish hard hardcover books. Yeah, and I mean, can I read Johnny's question out? Yeah. If this makes any sense to discuss at some point, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on the role a librarian plays or could play in support of a specific writer. This could be public or academic or just in general, what ways a researcher slash librarian might offer assistance slash support to writers? Love librarians. Love them. Love librarians. (laughs) There's uh, so much. Um, There's not only the idea of um, getting getting research um, from a librarian, you know, you know, how is it that uh, power electric power is distributed in this state? You know, that kind of thing that you need to know. Um, but there's also getting the word out about your books, and and getting um, there are actually networks of librarians that talk about, you know. Can we like get some recommendations for queer books? Can we get some recommendations for uh, books about anarchy? You know, so so very very much essential. I know the uh, Carl Brandon Society was really really excited when we got approached recently by someone who was a librarian and with a background in fundraising. Woohoo! Mm, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I. My oh, I was just going to say, uh, uh, incident, coincidentally, they are making a movie about um, Octavia Butler. <laughs> well, that could be good or it could be bad. Who's making <laughs> it? I, I've seen parts of it and it's, it's, it's good. It's a documentary and a musical. Oh. Yeah. No. <clears throat> When I see a movie about a writer's life, I tend to stay away because writers generally don't have very interesting lives. They, you know, you you get to see um, somebody wad up, pull a piece of paper out of the typewriter, wad it up and put it across the room. And that's the only action. That's the parts we're willing to share with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, every, every movie about a writer that I've liked, like that movie about Shirley Jackson, about her god-awful marriage and how terrible she was to people. That was good stuff. 
Well, that was pretty good. Yeah. I'm I'm married to a public librarian. That's been his career his whole life. And uh, I'll say that the things that I've learned about what librarians can do for authors often go way past what a lot of authors know. I think as, as Nello and Terry both pointed out, library buyers make a huge difference both in democratizing access to books that people might not be able to afford, especially when they're new, and also in what's called collections development, which is to say people who have a specific list of books to acquire, they want books in Spanish, books by black writers, books by queer writers. And they also work around a calendar of events so books that are specific to, say, the Children's Summer Reading Program or to Black History Month or to Women's History Month or to Pride as a season, and that these displays and key events can help bring in uh, authors from the community and authors who are on the road to do events that help a community stay engaged with its library, to use it as a resource, and to help get books into people's hands. Mm -hmm. I also know from experience that library copies being available of your book contributes to the number of reviews you see in the wild, especially book blogger reviews, book Instagram reviews, and people who use Goodreads love their libraries. So you should never fret about a loss of sales because people who read those books not only read them, but also review them, recommend them to their friends, take them to their book groups, and then put them back on the shelf so someone else can read it again. And they might even buy one. They might even buy one. I've had people tell me they got my book at the library and they loved it. So they bought themselves a copy. That's a double win for me. Yeah. Yeah. If you and and in countries that, that recognize that importance of libraries, um, I get a check once a year from Canada because the government goes through the libraries, does a survey and cuts writers a check for meant to represent, it's not as high as, but meant to represent royalties they would have otherwise lost. Huh. That's spectacular. I know they do that in Britain. Right. I never cool. heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice. Uh, and even if that didn't happen, I wouldn't care because of everything Meg has just said. Yeah, as an American author not making that money, I'm still 100% for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Canada's good. I have a friend who's a playwright who lives in Canada. And his plays don't make much money, but he gets a, a subsidy from, Can from the Can Canadian government to keep him alive. You know? Canscape, yeah. And he's, he's actually an English guy who's um, learned French as part of his PhD or something in, in, in England, but then he moved to Canada because if you're in, in Canada, well, you would know about this now, well, if you speak French and you live in Quebec, then you get, a, a, you get points for that. Do you speak any French at all? Je me suis spécialisé en français à l'université. Oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is that because of Canada or just because of you? I started studying it in Jamaica. Um, uh, but it, it actually makes me rare amongst Anglophone Canadians. <laughs> yeah, well, your father was an academic and a professor, wasn't he? He was an actor, a playwright, a poet who also taught. He taught high school. Huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to take I'm another looking, question? Yeah. Um, and Jerry's been patiently waiting. And she says, as writers of Specfic, how has the pandemic influenced your approach to world building? Are you mm -hmm. thinking about writing for our times differently than you would have two years ago? Not, well, I am. Not me. No. I am a little bit because I, I think, um, and this is more about TV than, <laughs> than writing, but um, did anybody see that thing called Years and Years, that British show about the family um, and where Emma Thompson played the, the Trump character and changed it? Nobody saw this on TV? Making oh. a note. Anyway, it was, it was a dystopian view of what's going to happen in the world the next 30 years. And it's, it's kind of horrifying. But there's, they leave out the pandemic. It's not there. And I know. Um, so I love Stan Robinson's books, and he's he's done several. But the thing nobody thought of was the was this pandemic, and it's such a weird one because it doesn't kill that many people, but it shuts down everything because it's so um, easily transferable. It it spreads so easily. But not, I I was thinking about the only fiction writing I do is a little thing in Locus Magazine called. Um, this month in history with trying to invent the history those. of the future. And I usually do it for um, 
uh, mostly for humor. But um, I'm, I'm always, uh, I, I have to think, lately I've had to think a lot about different kind of pandemics and, and, and how they would actually change the world. It, more so and more immediately than say global warming. You know, it's, uh, anyway, yeah, I think about it. So I, I, really I actually have been told that some th stuff that I wrote like years ago is, is on point for the pandemic. That's why I'm, what I mean when I say I'm I'm not changing anything because people are saying it's already there. Mm, I think the the thing I'm reminding myself is we keep trying to think to a moment when this will be over, but there's another one coming and there's another one coming. Um, so I try to be mindful of that. Where I'm seeing uh, one instance I saw this past week is amongst. Um, emerging writers and student writers of, of science fiction and fantasy. Um, I'm working with a group now who's reading um, Connie Willis's Doomsday, Doomsday book. And you've got students, some of them who've now had COVID twice, some of them who've had you know, scares in their, in their household um, and watching them go, oh, oh my God, people actually, we now know that people actually do act like she describes in this novel. Uh, that people will try so hard to make everything normal that they will ignore everything that's good for them. Uh, and so it's being a bit traumatic for them, I think. But um, it, it, I, I'm with you, Nisi, it isn't really changing how I write much because I tend to write disasters anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was writing about, actually, I was writing a story inspired by Octavia Butler um, about uh, head lice. Um, and, and they were like, oh, yes, this is so much about COVID. I was like, okay, you do you. <laughs> it's the little things that, that do change how you think. The last public event I attended before lockdown was actually the uh, blues opera of Octavia's Parable of the Sower. Oh, I attended man. it theater in LA and we knew what was coming. Everybody in that theater knew what was coming. So the there was no way to distance, but the lineups coming out of the women's washroom got longer because everybody came out of there looking like a doctor about to go into surgery because everybody had been washing their hands. <laughs> it, it's the, those little tiny details that, that uh, start to pop more for you that you knew them intellectually, but now mm -hmm. they're, they're dire, they're real. Well, what about utopias? Does, uh, I mean, it seems to me like a lot of science fiction, good as well, as well as the bad, has been dystopian and very little of it is utopian these days. And I think, particularly of, of Nisi, I think of you as pretty much as a utopian writer. I'm thinking about Everfair, but other stuff. But um, what do you all think about this? Do you, do you ever, think about going against the dystopian tide or is it, are you in it? <laughs> I'm writing a story right now where people live in Tazas, um, temporary autonomous zones. Yay! <laughs> yeah, I love in that. A, in a way it is utopian and it's utopian in defiance of the fact that dystopia happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm. Yeah, though, though I say that I, I'm, I'm always writing about disasters, I'm always also looking at ways our world could be better, could be organized better, could be better for more people, could be, you know, us not killing the planet. So that makes its way into the work. And I think sometimes the impulse to dystopia is because fiction is about bad things happening. It's where the energy for your plot comes. But I remember reading uh, Stan, Stan Robinson's Pacific Edge, which is basically a utopia it's you know and it's full of character development and conflict and stuff happening a lot of it happens at meetings about you know water rights but it's all in there and he was one of the people who showed me that that you don't have to lean on dystopia to get your plot that's true and stan stan is is um always looks for a happy ending <laughs> And I think he's a very, um, he's, he's a, um, I think one of the most, one of the biggest modern utopian writers. It's never 
directly about a utopia, but it, except Pacific Edge actually was, it was explicitly a utopia novel. And I think this new one, the, um, the committee, uh, what is it, the agency for the future or the, this big thing about global warming is a, is a utopia novel. And, uh, and the few novels I've written have tended to be utopian because I don't know, I, I like happy endings myself somehow. <laughs> I don't know what I can say to add to what you've said, except yes, yes, yay, temporary autonomous zones. Yes. And um, although, although Everfair, the people in it are trying to create a, a utopia, I think of it more as the process of utopia rather than as um, the goal uh, that everyone gets to. It's it's not it's not. It's getting there that is that is the important thing, not having arrived. No, but that's why utopians, uh, that's how they work. I, I think that's what Donald was saying. It's what Stan has always said, because you still have just as many problems. You know, there's, there's still just as much um, suffering and anxiety and uh, relationships that don't work and stuff. And and you tend to fool with that. But uh, let me, uh, just to change the subject, you said that, uh, Nalo, you said that uh, Connie Willis was writing a, a book called Doomsday. I haven't heard of that. It's a it's an older book that she won, I think, the Hugo for called the Doomsday Book. And it's a time travel um, that has two pandemics happening simultaneously. So the, one of the characters go back to the time of the Black Plague. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Connie makes that so immediate, but there's also um, another plague that's happening in the current world. So she, she sort of plays the two off each other uh, and the modern day response to, wait, does this guy just have a bad flu? No, that's not the flu. <laughs> Versus this, this person, these two people who are from the modern day who go back and are trying to live amongst people who are dealing with the Black Plague. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful book. Yeah. Um, partly because it's got all the things that Connie does so well. It's got her, her deep moral conviction. It's got her humor, except I, I'm reading, rereading it now thinking, why did I ever think this was funny? Because it's dire, <laughs> it's dire, dire, dire. I can't put the book down. I never could with Doomsday Book. But all of a sudden now that I'm, I'm older and know I can die. It's, <laughs> and I know what's going to happen to these characters. It's a, it's a great book. I'll have to, I haven't followed her work. I haven't followed anybody recently that much, but I love Connie Willis's work, I, I think. But it's funny, the... Uh, she and I were both the guests of honor at uh, one of the, at some convention, probably the one in Florida. The, the it's some, it's it's a, yeah, and uh, we were we were there as the shared guests of honor because we both wrote romantic comedies, which is what I think of her work a lot as romantic. <laughs> but Except not yours. That. Wait, what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Which well, I, your a lot of my short stories are, I think they're okay. romantic comedies, but yeah, yeah, okay. I can see that. It wasn't yeah. up to me. Somebody else thought of that, but <laughs> we've got a couple more questions. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Nalo, why don't you read it? Because you, you do so well with it. Um, yeah, I live on Zoom now, so <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have a corporeal body anymore. I'm just uploaded. So Ben says, how would you advise on incorporating a radical personal philosophy, ever growing but still incomplete, into fiction in a way that is enjoyable for both the writer and the reader? Ooh. I can speak to that. I Because um, I actually had a dream in which um, I, I invented <laughs> a radical uh, social movement, um, the five petals of thought it was called. And um, so I've, I've written three stories based on that, um, that movement. And the way to do it so that it's fun for your, yourself and your readers and hopefully for your characters too, is to have them go through living those things, living, living those uh, attitudes and philosophies. And um, yeah, so the stories that I did were, um, called The Third Petal, um, 
fourth and most important and um, new action. And yeah, there's just like, you know, it can be fun for people to like try and do stuff and, and get frustrated and find new ways to do it. Sure. It, um, just dive right into that uh, world that would be built on the principles that you espouse. What are That's these right. principles? What is this movement? I haven't heard of this. Oh, yeah, because it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> The, the five petals of thought, I had this dream. I was like, I had a problem at work and someone was saying, well, why didn't you use the five petals of thought? And I'm like, well, duh. <laughs> have you guys found, I, I find the longer I have a career as a writer, the more I'm editing my own dreams. Oh yeah, I edit my dreams all the time. It's yeah. so weird. <laughs> So I, I like saw the like the the school where they taught it and I knew about all these like you know factory workers that that uh, put it together and like all these beats that espoused it and yeah so <laughs> what's not fun about that for, for me it's often about representation mm -hmm. and it's things that people some people might notice but people who've been left out will so I, I remember being interviewed by uh, two women about the, the comic I, I was working on for DC um, between 2018 and 2020. And uh, they kept saying, there's all these fat people just having lives. <laughs> Cause we do, you know? and <laughs> you guys know that, but simply just putting it in there and making it, normalizing it, you know, yeah. they're, they're running around fighting with their sons and eating food and having sex and wielding swords and being goddesses. It's just what you do. Right? <laughs> I think that's, that's always been the secret weapon for me is not to make a big deal out of the world you wish was. It's just to make it incidental. So I had a, a minor crisis within myself because the book I was working on over the summer was a noir. And it is really difficult to write within the framework of noir as a genre and critically engage with what policing means in our society at the same time. Yeah. Because the hero of the noir is always either a legitimate cop or a worse cop who has no oversight and no regulations whatsoever. So I started pulling it apart and really asking myself, if you lived in a society where police still had to exist, but they had to behave better, what would that look like and what things would that cop take for granted and what things would that cop have, uh, expect to have to explain and what would it take for him to lose his job mm -hmm. and in incorporating those things my book got better and more hopeful and I, I, I wouldn't say that it's a utopia but I definitely like I worked that muscle of imagining a better world instead of a worse one. That's and it, fascinating. What's the book? Oh, it hasn't sold yet, but uh, it's it's a it's a gonzo noir that I've been telling my agent is uh, it's the leftovers meets Roger Rabbit. <gasps> so happy right now, and I mean I used to. That's I think a modern day sense of what very loose sense of what noir is. I think we've stripped away a lot of what noir actually is doing, and I learned that when. Um, uh, my university, we were looking for a professor of noir. And so we were doing uh, interviews and people come and read their work. And I, that was when I had the revelation, wait a minute, a lot of this is about being working class. Yes, noir that is about class. The detective is often working class and where the flea bitten and the hopelessness comes from is this person knowing shit's not gonna change. He's broke, yeah, and he has no way out. And also, yeah. You can identify the villain in almost any noir because it's the most well-dressed woman in the room. <laughs> the villain because she's wealthy, like nine times out of 10. No, I totally agree with that theory. Yeah, so I love that you, you then picked it apart and, and did the challenge because the thing about noir for me is, is its sense of almost hopelessness. Yes. But that you said, no, we can, we can fix this. <laughs> If you don't abandon yourself to trope as a creator, if you if you begin to engage critically with the things that you love and the things that represent the bumpers on your and your imagination, you can do incredible things. And I think that's the best way to incorporate the more radical parts of your philosophy. Take it apart and ask it to work differently. 
Well, I'm fascinated by this novel. So you don't have a title for this, but you're yeah, the, the title is The Snatch. Ah, so happy. <laughs> well, but I, I, I think it's, it's I mean, you talk, if you talk about dealing with today's problems, it's about defunding the police, that whole idea. And so, how would it work? You know? Right. But I, mean, I wrote about a police force that was radically defunded, that was disarmed, that was subject to internal affairs drones that followed them around independently recording their activities. I talked about a, a, a definite change in interrogation techniques and how arrests go down. Like it was real work. And it again involved librarians because I had to call for <laughs> research and ask about SFPD because I don't know how they do what they do now. So I couldn't imagine what it would be like in a different future. Huh. Well, that's that's fascinating. That's about using today's world to what would it look like if this piece of it was changed? You know, yeah. I that I never thought of that. That's great. I got asked one time to do. Um, my agent was Frances Golden. I don't know if you'll know her. She was a a lefty agent in New York, and she wanted to do a book about what if socialism worked. You know, and so I was supposed to write a, a short story about what if socialism really worked, and that was kind of fun. But I could only take it about to about thirty five hundred or four thousand words because I was trying to think of a way to do it. And um, so I just made a, a a family reunion where a bunch of people got together and talked about what they've been doing for Thanksgiving, and they're all complaining. But what they're complaining about is a world that actually works and there's going to be things in it that piss them off so i could make it work like that but that wouldn't that wouldn't make a whole novel yeah no, but it's good for a short I, I i want to say before we move on from socialism radical praxis and utopias that one of the most influential books I ever read in my life is uh, an ecological utopia written about radical praxis by separatists in San Francisco. It's called The Fifth Sacred Thing. And I think it is criminally underread. And that if you are queer or a radical activist or a weirdo or a collectivist, you should read it. It's called, the, what's it called? It's The Fifth Sacred Thing. It's a Harper Collins book written by a woman named Starhawk. Oh, I have read it. Just a million years ago, I need to reread it. <laughs> it holds up so well. It's mostly about the aftermath of a pandemic and the way these people free themselves out of uh, <laughs> uh, theocracy. Mm. And I think, you know, T Terry's talking about where you, you, you can only fit so much in. You can only take the idea so far. I think our readers take it the rest of the way. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's one of the lovely things. Um, if if I have done nothing but inspire a few people, then uh, I've done a lot, I think. Well, we have one other question, right? Yes, this is probably a question that's always asked, but what was your first writing rejection and how did you eventually get to your first publication? You mean first professional publication? Is that yeah, mean? let's assume that's what Mean. Yeah, because first publication is pretty murky. I mean, a lot of us, you know, won poetry contests in fourth grade or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, I still have a picture of 10 year old me holding up a plaque for an essay I won. <laughs> but so um, for me, my first rejection, I'm so glad they rejected this story. There's something about like centaurs getting drunk and fornicating and, you know, <laughs> I could so amazing. I could still sing the song the centaurs were singing as they were like getting it on. <laughs> but thank you, thank you, thank you for that rejection. <laughs> so who was it from? I don't even remember. I'm sure they no longer exist, but thank you, whoever you were. Um, the first publication was uh, in Asimov Science Fiction, uh, The Rainses, um, which was like, a ghost story, I guess, although I didn't think of it that way. It was just some dead people, <laughs> you know, talking to this girl. She wanted to find the Underground Railroad, so she went down into the basement. Oh, you're <laughs> that was the, Colson Whitehead. <laughs> that was the first story of yours I read, Nisi, as I was looking for Black writers of science fiction mm -hmm. and fantasy. Oh, I, really? I went to the library because the 
that issue of Asimov's had come and gone and they found a copy for me. Uh, and uh, I carried around that photocopy <clears throat> of your story for a long time. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you know, I just remembered the other grand master that we have in, in addition to Moorcock and um, and Quinn is uh, Chip Delaney, Samuel. Oh, of course. Delaney. Of course. Yeah. I'm so glad we finally got to mention him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. he's, he's on Facebook a lot. I stay in touch with him. But he, he did a famous essay to, about um, racism in science fiction which really dates back 20 or 25 years. But he talks about, um, he would go to science fiction conventions or, you know, and, or big uh, signings where there'd be a bunch of people. And he would all, he said, I, and I would always be put with Nalo Hopkinson. And we'd always sit at this, but, and he, he said, as writers, we're very different and we were totally different and we get along well, but the only reason we put it, we knew why they were putting us together at the table and that's kind of the way it worked you know it's a it's a did you ever see that essay oh yeah it's the it's part been of it is, for a long time. yeah part of it was the inspiration that took me to wisconsin with the idea that um maybe wisconsin could start addressing race and out of that came the carl brandon society yep yeah nella do you remember your first professional rejection um, I believe it was from Don, oh, I'm forgetting his surname. He is a Canadian editor of horror and he would do an annual anthology of, of, of Canadian horror. And it might not have been the first rejection, but it was the most encouraging rejection I've ever had. And it was a very early one where he said, I think this may be the best story I've ever read. It's not horror, but please keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Very encouraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and how would I go on to get published? I just kept sending stuff out. The um, you you just keep sending stuff out. Uh, uh, work on the story if you feel it needs working on, but always send the next thing out. And now rejections mostly don't sting as much. They are part of the job. They are utterly stingless at this point for me. Yeah. I think my first rejection from a real press was from Asimov's. Mm. Uh, I was very young and I was very green. And I thought like a lot of starting writers do that what if God and the devil did X is a compelling pitch. <laughs> it's not, and please believe me when I say they've read 900 versions of it and you are not clever. <laughs> and neither was I. So I you need... might be clever, but the story isn't. <laughs> it's so hard to make that clever and new. You have to realize it's so hard. Uh, so they were right to reject me and they were kind about it. And I felt like I'd been belt whipped in the face and I didn't submit again for years. <laughs> oh, I was such a baby. Anyway, I, I didn't write shorts for a while and I ended up my first pro publication was my first novel in, uh, in 2014. And I which did it backwards. I didn't hit. have any shorts out. Say that again. And which was a huge hit. And then you yeah. got. Yeah, it's uh, sold over 100,000 copies and it won me an award and it gave me the career I have now because yeah. I took the time to get better and to read a lot more. Mm. Yeah. And people like to say it's about becoming thick skinned, but I think that's bullshit. Don't, don't thicken your skin, um, but recognize when something is part of the job and a lot of the times when I became started doing editing myself I realized that a lot of the times when an editor says does not suit our needs at this time they are telling you the bald truth yep. they might already have a story that hits those notes or it's not the right genre or just wasn't ineffably what they were looking for they're yep. not editors don't have the time to be nice to you <laughs> I, I have had to reject I have had to reject friends I have yeah. had to reject you know, big names, like, okay, how many stories can we have in this anthology about people ripping out each other's hearts? <laughs> For instance, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of it kind of like I think of uh, doing a workout or doing the dishes. It's just, 
what you do, it's maintenance. <laughs> I mean, I like working out, but part of it, parts of it hurt, right? I think of it as days when there's no mail. Like it's not, <laughs> not personal. It's just a thing that happens. There'll be mail tomorrow. You keep sending letters out and eventually letters will come back. But it it really does, once you get used to it, as as you said, as maintenance, as business of you, as usual, yeah. this thing goes away. It's just, there's no mail today. Yeah, the other thing the editor isn't trying to do is they're not trying to shame you personally. They, they really, if you were to send them another story next week and they love it, they will be so happy for you and for themselves. It's not, they're not trying to destroy your sense of self. No, because you, you also have to realize you're, although you think of yourself as an artist and you're doing something, you're in, you've inserted yourself into a business and an editor is trying to put a book or a magazine together. He's not trying to, you know. Hurt your feelings. feelings. They have their own stuff to do. Yeah. yeah. And their own people to we've gotten the We've gotten the warning that we need to wrap up. Do we want to? I think um, there was one other thing which I will read. It's not a question that somebody wanted to add. This is April Rain Song who wants to add that the fifth sacred thing read by Maya Lilly is a fantastic audio book. Oh, wonderful. And Thank you. That's directed at you, Meg, I believe. Thank you. I love audiobooks, and I, I haven't gotten that one, so maybe I should, the next time I reread it, I'll do that. Okay. So we should call um, Ash back. Is he abandoned? I think they're, no, they're still there. I can see. Yeah, they're just, uh, they're just off screen. There they are. <laughs> hey, everyone. There he is. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for this really lively, uh, both like, very in-depth and intense conversation at times, but also very casual. It was really wonderful to just hear y'all kind of talk uh, business, uh, but also, you know, about these really <laughs> grand narratives that are affecting all of our lives right now, this moment. Um, so thank you again for being here tonight. I don't know if anybody had anything, any last words they wanted to share or anything like that. Well, I'd like to say one thing that I'd like to think Every, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of all these authors and I've worked in, as an editor, although these are not people. You, one of the things about the, um, the books that I do for um, PM, and I'm not really a PM employee, but anyway, this whole series was, uh, was put together really quite a while ago, about 10 or 15 years ago. And, um, and it was uh, put together because they wanted to have uh, uh, they wanted to enter the field of science fiction and I just moved out to California and they, they knew that I'd been in the field so I knew people and so I was able to to um, to start out with the people that I knew and eventually work up to the people I didn't know like Meg and, and some other people who are coming along. So uh, to me it's been a, a great pleasure to meet these people that I've worked with before and and but I don't see very often. So thank you all from me and thank you, Ash, for putting this together. And and thanks to PM for you know the the whole idea of outspoken authors was not my idea. It was Ramsey's. And Ramsey said, How would you think about doing this? And I thought, oh sure, why not? And I tried it and it's gone on now for quite a while. And um you know, it's been fun. So thanks. Mm -hmm. It's fun for me too. Yeah. Uh, it's always an honor to be thoroughly outclassed by everybody else in the Outspoken <laughs> series. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you for letting me tag along. Don't know about that. <laughs> I know the feeling though. All right, folks, hopefully, you know, uh, the next time uh, we're able to spend some time together, it'll be under different circumstances and maybe even in person in real life with one another, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. But thanks again so much for being here tonight. And thanks for everyone who attended the event and uh, watched live on Facebook. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Nalo. Thanks. Thank Nikki. you. I'll see you down the road. All righty. Next time. Okay. Bye. All right.